Oh, let's put this, got it. Okay. Well, it's awesome to be with you guys as always. I'm really privileged to have time with you all. With y'all, I'm getting this lingo down in the South. It's really groovy. I know not everyone here online is from the South, but I'm actually, we've just had a weekend of ministry in Moravian Falls. So uh, for me, it's like I'm I'm getting used to this culture difference because we we spent, um, we're just doing a, a Ameri- we're, we're over, obviously you can tell I'm Australian for those who don't know me, but um, we're in we're in America right now just doing ministry and we've been to lots of different kind of states. It's so amazing. Like I'm telling you, in America, it's the only place on earth where you change states and you feel like you've changed countries. Like it's it's mind blowing. I'm telling you, Australia is boring in that regard. You go you go to the southern border and you end up and the accents the same, the culture's the same, and you it's the same everywhere. But oh, maybe slight changes in accent. You wouldn't hear it, but we do. But it's like we were in New England just before Christmas and over Christmas, and then we've just come down to the south, and it's just like oh, the accent difference. And well, we started in Pittsburgh, and that that to me that accent was quite you know normal and then we go up to new england and the the boston accent and then you got the rhode island accent where they all sound like gangsters it's hilarious there and um it's just so full on i love it and then so we're in the south here so i'm getting used to the old y'all thing so that's really fun and the food difference is cool too so my kids are having a major cultural experience so that's um that's really neat too but anyway, it's really great to be with you all. And do you under can I, as as everybody okay with my accent? Can you all understand me? Yes, great. perfectly clear. So, great, that's good. Some people, and I hope I don't speak too much slang. I've realised how much Australian slang I do speak, and some people are like, "What did you just say?" I'm like, "Okay, so I'm trying to speak normal English." Um, but anyway, if you don't understand, I think I I think I do pretty well, but. Some places in America, they, they kind of think I'm a bit crazy. But anyway, so I'm I'm just blessed to share with you today. I really, I just realized, so this is your first class for the year, is it? Ah, so that's interesting. Okay, that that makes a bit of sense then, what kind of God's given me uh, for, the, for the class or just for you guys, uh, what I just had on my heart to share with you, because all of you know that I'm I'm more prophetic in my thrust. So I tend to kind of deliver prophetic uh, words in the sense of teaching. So when I was sitting with the Lord, um, you know, just asking him what he had for today with with our gathering together, um, you know, there's been a few things on my heart, but he culminated it in a really fresh way. And, and so I'm really excited about that. I'm sure a lot of you, maybe maybe not, but I'm but I'm sure some of you uh, may have heard, you know, in the prophetic conversation at the moment regarding uh, 2024, and some have been speaking about the relevance of Psalm 24. I don't know if any of you have have tuned into that, but um, for me, Psalm 24 has been on my grid for probably 10 years, and I even wrote a book. Um, the Avenger, and it's all around Psalm 24. So I was really, um, you know, excited to to hear that. Like it wasn't so much the Lord was saying to me, Anita, Psalm 24 is 2024. I was just, you know, you hear what people are saying. And because I've been preaching Psalm 24 for the last 10 years, um, I, I feel like the Lord is beginning to give me an understanding of why in this year, um He's, you know, you can have revelation, but it continues to grow, doesn't it? And it continues to expand and he builds and he adds to it and all of that kind of thing. Hi. So, Hi. so, um, yeah. So anyway, so I, I just, I, I'm going to share with you, as I always do, just a few things on my heart regarding kind of what he's sharing. The way he talks to me is he, he reveals things that he's, um, he's sharing for the body at the, you know at the time do i need to change the the screen at all or is the screen fine i don't know sometimes i get mixed up with this no, the, screen's, my, the screen's fine i'm yeah, okay fine. all right Chris. yeah i pinned okay. you in the middle oh yeah. great super so um so yeah i i i tend to god gives me just like a gen like a word for the body in seasons and so then um 
and and it's like a, a landscape. That's probably the way I could explain it. It's like a landscape, and then he then he highlights different, um, I guess, areas of that landscape when he has me share with different groups. And so, for this for this gathering together today, I just want to um, kind of give you a bit of a landscape of how I'm. I'm. You know, we all see in part, so I'm just going to share my part that I'm seeing. Um, and I'm sure, you know, God's going to speak to you and has been speaking to you. Uh, and I just pray that the Lord will um, give you some gems today. So I really believe this is what the Lord's been showing me. I really believe that the, the body of Christ in this season is in a sifting season. They're at, uh, the Lord has spoken to me that we're at the threshing floor. Um, and I had a dream about a year ago in January 2023. And the Lord showed me he in a in the dream there was this lady singing a song and the lord said in the dream this song is the word of the lord and she was singing this she said beat us lord from what we know i know that sounds strange in a song but that was the song and i instantly knew it was the threshing of where the wheat is beaten on the threshing floors to separate that chaff so it can go into the fire and the wheat then can get go to another level and get actually be useful for what its purpose and and I believe that's like a we can see that in many dimensions but we could say that that's another level up and I feel like the body of Christ are going into a level up but in this level up it's a new thing God's doing a new thing and the old thing has to be kind of separated in the sense that sometimes you know you look at the wilderness journey of the Israelites and they went from the wilderness faith to a possessing faith there was a two it, it wasn't that um, the wilderness, the way that they were led in the wilderness was wrong or anything like that. It was just the season of how God was working with them. But when they had to go into the promised land, they had to do things differently. And that's why the Lord said to Joshua, you know, um, you, you've got to let there be a space between the ark and the people because you've never been with this way before. And I really feel like that's kind of where we're at, that we are at that space where God is leading us into a new dimension and into, into new things. I even believe into territory taking and possessing, even stepping into fulfillment of promises, but it, it, it's going to require a greater level of surrender. And in that surrender, is the threshing it's the separating of what we know it's the separating of the things and the ways that we've done things in the past and even our all the you know the way we've moved with god and the lord is actually bringing us down to the threshing floor to to um that you know when you think of wheat when wheat is growing chaff chaff's different to tares okay we know that so uh, well let's talk about chaff chaff protects the wheat as the wheat grows into maturity but then the chaff is not useful anymore and it has to be separated from the wheat so that the wheat can go on and to do the fulfillment of the purpose it was it was created to do and that's ground into you know grain and flour and and be made as bread whatever the process is so you know we you know the way that we i guess the wilderness in the sense or the the preparation process or the the seasons of God, even people that he can have alongside us and walk with us or mentor us, or they can all become chaff because we have to grow up. We have to come out from under some, some sort of, um, you know, old patterns or old, old ways. And, and not that some of them may be kind of not that great, but some of them were ordained by God in that season um, so chaff can be a good thing that God's done in the past, or it can be a limiting thing that needs to just be removed from you. And I believe it's a twofold thing. It can even be enemies that um, the Lord um, is wanting to deliver us from in this season so that we can enter into a greater portion of freedom and overcoming. So that's kind of a background of what I feel like, um, you know, where where we're at in the sense, in the terms of what God's been speaking to me about and so with this threshing there is a shaking and so you know I don't know if many of you've heard that but the Lord is just in 2020 um it would have been the second it was this it was 2 to 2020 2nd of February 2020 the this was like oh I think a week after COVID may have been kind of um even realized so COVID was not on my mind I thought when I heard COVID come on the news, I thought it was going to be another swine flu and over and, you know, whatever. I, I didn't even never think that it was going to turn into what it turned into. So my mind was not there, but in, in this moment and in that day on the 2nd of the 2nd, 2020, the Lord 
um, we were in a service and the prophetic word of the Lord came through me and the Lord said, I'm going to shake all nations. It was out of Haggai chapter two, and I'm going to shake what, what can be shaken and whatever cannot be shaken is the kingdom of God that remains. And I'm sure, you know, we've heard that a lot, but um, I feel like a lot of, uh, you know, that scripture in Hebrews 12, actually then the, the second part of that scripture, it actually reveals what the shaking looks like. And he says, because I'm an all consuming fire. And so the shaking of the, the, um, the seasons of shaking, are actually the firing of the Lord to purify his people um, from, from the things well, that can be shaken. So those things that can be shaken in our life are impurities. And so the fire comes to purify out of our life, the things that we trust in, or we rely on, or that are um, our own reasoning or ourself, we can rely on our own wisdom and understanding. We can rely on people. We can rely on whatever it is, our own intellect. We can rely on our own resources, whatever. But the Lord never wants, he doesn't, it's not, it's, it's okay to have those things, but the Lord doesn't want our trust there. Obviously I know this is elementary, but so this is the processes of God and why the Lord it brings us to the threshing floor and, and shakes what can be shaken because those things creates a mixture. If it's, if it's, if it remains, um, it, it, it becomes mixture and our faith is mixed and therefore we become something that's called double-minded. So this is, I'm just giving you the trajectory of where I'm going here. And I'm going to unpack Psalm 24 um, with you for a little bit and, and, um, and, and kind of give you uh uh, put flesh and bones to to kind of what I'm saying here. So so this shaking, I believe in 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 2024, is um, on a level that we've not yet entered into. And it's not to create fear, and it's not to say or oh, doom gloom or, but but the reality is um, we are coming into a season of battle, and and this Psalm 24 speaks all about the mighty man of war. It speaks all about this Lord of hosts who leads us into battle. And so I begin to understand, oh, okay, Lord, I see the picture here of this Psalm 24 aligning with um, 2024 in the sense that God, we we are entering a season of shaking, but like that God is going to shake the nations. That's what he says in Haggai. And, and he says in the wealth, will be transferred into the house of God. It says that in Haggai. And so there's going to be this, there's going to be a whole lot of things that are going to go down. And, and, and to be honest, I really don't believe anyone's got a handle on it. I think we partly see, and we, we, we God's given us a bit of heads up. But as, as I said before, the ark has to go before because we've not been this way before. So ark, the ark for me is the, you know, is the word of God in the presence of God. It's our intimacy. It's our walk with the Lord. We are now the temples, obviously. So the Lord has to lead us and guide us. We can't, as I said, we can't go the way that we used to. And so if we're not threshed, we will go the way that we're, we're used to, and we will miss it in this new hour and we won't level up and rise to this new occasion of uh, being victorious in this battle because you know that when they went into the the promised land they had to fight for for the, for what was theirs and and the lord gave me a word in 2020 when was it 2022 that's passover 2022 and and i always take notice of the words that the lord gives me at passover for some reason it ends up culminating with rosh hashanah i i don't know how that works but it just does and I got this word uh, on Passover and the Lord said, I came to recover all. And I said, oh, that was a new word, Lord, recover. I thought you meant you always say redeem when you're talking regarding Passover. And, and he's like, no, I'm, I'm talking about recovering. I came not only to redeem, but I came, I came that you may recover all. And then I was led to the story of David at Ziklag where, where he was, he asked the Lord, shall I go up and all of his, um, you know, his wives, his children, all of his mighty men's wives and children were stolen and they were led into captivity. All of his goods, everything was gone. And he asked the Lord, shall we go up? And the Lord said, you shall go up and you shall recover all. And so he he was able then to um, go in and 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 retrieve uh, his loved ones and all of their loved ones. And, and obviously um, that was a victory. But the Lord was showing me, then, then I began to hear like people like, notable prophetic voices like Chuck Pierce began to say that that 
uh, the last Hebraic year, 5783 was all about re divine recovery and and all of this. So it, that it, it, you cannot, I guess you can't speak of recovering without speaking of war. There, there is a battle to possess that which is rightfully ours, and that's what part of this redemption process is. So, so it doesn't always, I guess, look in look the way that we think it's going to look. Sometimes when God promises us things, we just think, okay, we know there's a bit of we got to stand by faith, we got to wait, we got to you know use patience and all of this. But I really feel like what this season we're entering into is a season like the body of Christ has never experienced before. It's going to be the most I think glorious days for the for the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. I think it's going to be, um, in some ways, the darkest of times, but it's going to be the most glorious of times. And for those that are ready and prepared and and are awake and watching, to be honest, um, and we don't want to be like the Church of Sardis in Revelation, where they were asleep, um, and we want to be awake and watching. And so, I really feel that this is uh, the Lord's cry to His people in this hour. Psalm 24, and as we unpack it, is actually the invitation of the blueprint of God, how to how to ride with the Lord of hosts and how to partner with this man in battle, this mighty man of war, as he is called, um, and into victory. Because whether we like it or not, there is a war that's raging and it's for the nations of the earth and it's for souls. And it's for um, and and so we we cannot escape battle as Christians. We you know we we hear we are the army of the Lord. We just cannot escape it. We just need to know how, and 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 what the blueprint of God is. And it's not the blueprint of man. And so I believe Psalm twenty four is a blueprint. It's a blueprint to to reveal the ways of God and how we can enter victoriously in this season of level up for the for the body of Christ. Okay. So let's go to Psalm 24 and I'm just going to switch between my notes um, a little bit here. Um, where, where am I? And my Bible here, Psalm 24. Okay, so I know you probably all know it off by heart, but we're just going to go through it uh, a little bit. And I just want to show you what I feel like the Lord, how it's a blueprint. We can just summarize it, but how it how it looks like a blueprint so he goes, the earth is the Lord and the fullness of, of it, the world, who, they who dwell in it. So, you know, he begins talking about the earth. He's talking about the nations. He's talking about it being his. Okay. So I always look, you know, this is a doctorate class. We always look at context. We always look at the train of thought. We always look at the line of thought and the beginning of what, what, how the Lord begins this passage. So the earth is the Lord's and the fullness of it, the world, they who dwell in it. So the souls of men. And so we know that the ending of this passage is about the man, the man of war that needs to come in. So you think, okay, he starts off with the earth is the Lord's and then he talks about the king of glory coming in. So to me, what when I look at this, I look at the earth is the Lord's and I'm going to fight for it. That's how I see it. I'm going to come in, I'm going to fight for it. And so then he goes, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the currents and the rivers. Who shall go up to the mountain of the Lord? So now he starts changing the topic a little bit. And um, and he says, who shall go up into the mountain of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? And we know uh, metaphorically the mountain of the Lord and the holy place is the presence of God. It is the very presence of God where, you know, um, Moses was in um, the, the mountain of the Lord. It, 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 it talks about intimacy. That's what this language is speaking of, intimacy. Who shall come into the presence of God? Who shall come into intimacy with him? So he's talking about the earth, the people of the earth. And now he now he begins to speak the blueprint. He, has, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted himself up to falsehood or to what is false, non-sworn deceitfully. Okay, so let's just let's just pause there for a little sec. Okay, I had a dream. Now, this is what I'm saying with the way God works with me. He always will give me a dream. Well, I, I don't ask for it. He just seems to do it without me kind of, I've just kind of put two and two together with the patterns of the Lord over the years. And this year in January, it's always in the earlier parts of the year, just like last year, I had the dream about beat us, Lord, from what we know about the threshing. This year I had a dream. And in the dream, it was like two, a week ago. It was just after New Year's. New Year's, New Year's. 
And I know God works on the Hebraic calendar and all that, but I also believe the significance for us in the Gregorian New Year kind of space. However that works, I just do. He just seems to operate like that too. So he gave me this dream. Uh, and in the dream, I was the the I was overseeing some some, I guess, fellowships of the body of Christ. I was overseeing um some communities and I began to um, kind of, I was, the, the the places of gatherings I was making extremely clean. Like I was being, I don't know, we call it in Australia, clean freaks. Um, like just super clean, super over, over the top, making sure every nook and cranny of this building where we were gathering was perfectly clean. Um, and then I began to get hand sanitizer out and I went around putting hand sanitizer on everyone's hands. And I was, I was being OCD, if you like, uh, with hand sanitizer. And, and I began to be mocked by other leaders and other, other, uh, you know, people that, that, that began to say, oh, you're strange. You know, what, why are you so over the top OCD of this hand sanitizer? And it was, but there was a regal, I was dressed in this regal outfit. It was like, Regal is the only way I can describe it. You know how in dreams it's hard to kind of convey language, but in the dream I felt it, it was like there was a level up. It was a level up. And and I was dressed all of a sudden in this regal kind of attire and everything was immaculate and shining. And 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 as I was overseeing, I was, I was you know, hand, I, it wasn't once. I would go to people three times and and wash their hands and clean their hands and then clean everything and scrub everything and but it drew a lot of persecution it drew a lot of uh, attitudes to those that didn't hold those standards of cleanliness if you like um it drew a lot of uh judgment and people were kind of saying well well this you know this is legalistic this is religious you don't need to to be over uh the top with with clean being clean and they began to preach a message that was of compromise and I and I knew that this message was going to contaminate the people that were hearing and they were lowering the standard saying you don't need to listen to that that's ridiculous and then um the dream continued and I I and and they were challenging the authority that was on on whatever this cleaning business was doing and then later in the dream, I came over to them and I just, I loved on them. And I just said, look, I love you. And I said, um, I said, you know, I don't have a problem with you. Um, and cause it was almost like when you, when you try it, when, when the, when God uses those to raise a standard in the body, those that haven't been walking in that standard can maybe project a, a sense of feeling like, they're they're not at that same um pursuit if that makes sense and so um and then it creates this pushback um and then a justification but the justification was actually contamination I hope you're following me so anyway what I felt like and when I started to say to this lady I love you these cup this couple that in particular that were preaching contamination and there was another man that stood near them that I know and he Actually, I needed to interrupt here and say to you, this couple were actually used in a past move of God. So that's key. And this other man in the dream that was with them was very good at building churches through programs and, you know, entertainment and marketing strategies because he has a degree in marketing. So God was showing me a picture of the old in the sense of the level of the old, when we need to level up, there's another level of purity that comes. There's another level of purging and purifying that God's going to bring through the body of Christ to level up. Like the gowns that I had on was a level up. It was a regal status. And these, these people from the old move were feeling inferior. And we've heard that saying so many times, the old is what persecutes the new, but it doesn't have to be that way. It really doesn't. God wants everyone to come through. And so when I began to love on them and I say, I love you, I don't judge you. It was like they broke down and they just started to weep. And it was like, God is saying that love is the key in this hour. That's going to break down that persecution. Like he's asking us to love those who persecute us. So I really feel like this clean hands matches 
and this cleansing and and this purity matches this Psalm 24 because he it's who shall come into the presence of God, the mountain of the Lord, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, he who has gone through the purification process of um of allowing the Lord's work in their life and pure hand, clean hands. We're going to see soon what that means, but I'm going to keep going here because we're going to unpack that in the New Testament of James, where he talks about what a clean hands and a pure heart looks like. So we need to understand what that looks like. Obviously, it's the works that we do, but we need to know how they become unclean and and how our heart is not pure. So I just wanted to share all that. I'm glad I've got a bit of time here with you guys. This is good. Someone needs to put in the comments. How, hang on, where is this chat? I need to see the chat. Can someone put in the comments, George or Nancy, if you're there, how much time that I have, like, so I can keep looking at the you've got, you've got till actually uh, six o'clock. So oh, great. Have oh, a great awesome. Time. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Because it's, I really want to unpack it um, properly. So I won't probably take that long, but I just wanted to make sure. Okay, so, um, okie dokie. So, where am I up to? Okay. Um, pure heart. All right. So we're going to unpack what that is, but I just want to keep going for a sec. So it says, so then it says, um, hang on, sorry. I'm just getting reading here. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go back to the scripture because I've lost my place. So he has, uh, who has not lifted himself up to falsehood or to what is false, non sworn deceitfully. So actually in the Hebrew, which I thought was really cool, falsehood, in the in the amplified, it says falsehood, but in other translations it says idols. Okay. But falsehood is idolatry because falsehood is vanity. That's what it actually means in the Hebrew. Vanity, youth, use, and that which is useless and worthless. So in other words, a counterfeit version. So we know idols are a counterfeit version of our worship. And so the Lord is saying that he who has clean hands and a pure heart and who's not lifted, now we see the language here, lifted themselves up to that which is counterfeit, to that which is a counterfeit expression of my presence, that have not gone and sought after fulfillment outside of my presence or outside of intimacy with me. Those who have not lifted themselves up, who've given themselves um, who've stood up for or or have come into agreement with um, that which is fake, that which isn't real, that and that's religion as well. It's not just, you know, the world. It's religion as well. That which is counterfeit to him, you, dead works of religion, doing things in our own strength, programs, you know, all of that kind of stuff, and, and the list goes on and on and on. But that has not lifted himself up to falsehood um, and this – and. This is a generation of Jacob. So now he's saying, now he's going to say, he's he's now explaining what, what kind of a people are going to open the gates for the king of glory. So this is a gener it's a generation of people, of Jacob, of those who seek him and seek his face. This is the blueprint. Who seek him, and it means to inquire of and to require of him with necessity. It means we can't, we know that we cannot do this without him. Life, daily, our, our even our walk with God, it, it has to be done in sync in the intimate, from the, in, everything has to come from the intimate chambers of intimacy. Our, we are led now by the spirit of God. We are, we are moving from the birthing place of, because you know what it says? It says here in First John, it says, that whatever is born of God overcomes the world, even our faith. So we cannot overcome without it being first born of God. And things aren't born of God unless it's born from intimacy. You have to first conceive something to give birth to it. And conceiving is through intimacy. So anything born of God has to begin with intimacy. And then whatever is born of God out of the intimate place overcomes the world. Now we are able to be victorious in battle and in possessing and taking nations. And so no matter what is flying around us, the intimate place is is the place. So it says this is a generation of Jacob. Now, for me, Jacob, when the Lord speaks of Jacob and not Israel, I look at a person who fought. I look at a person. Jacob wrestled into intimacy. Jacob, Jacob, I, I feel like that story where the he actually met the angel of the Lord, 
before that, we know Esau was coming up. Well, we don't really know. Jacob thought Esau was coming after him. He, he was freaking out, thinking that Esau's going to, you know, have his vengeance on him. Um, and so he he went into a wrestle because Esau, we know, represents the flesh. And Jacob was given the blessing, but he had to wrestle into the blessing. And so this is what he's speaking of here, are people who are going to fight for the blessing. And he wrestled and he actually put to death his carnal nature, Jacob, that day by wrestling for the blessing. So when we go, when we, it's like put ourselves on the altar of God, we enter and, and we, we, we put ourselves on the altar of Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. It says actually there that it's a living sacrifice that's holy and pleasable unto God. And it's our acceptable and most intelligent worship. That's what it says in the Amplified Classic Version. So, and it's a reasonable offering. So, you know, sometimes we think what God requires of us is, is, is unreasonable. I don't know about you, but sometimes I've thought some things he's required of me is unreasonable. Some, you know, but but it's reasonable. It's our reasonable offering is our life. And and so verse one and two of Romans 12 is the, is the altar of sacrifice. And then what happens is when we surrender on the altar, you know, we know it responds with fire. The purification process happens when we surrender and say yes to the Lord. He, he begins to purify because the further we begin to, to seek God, as we say here, he's a a generation of seekers the more we pursue him the more we're going to meet with his fire there's no other way because he is an all-consuming fire which is great because intimacy is give is intimacy is given to those that are pure that's what it says here in psalm 24 intimacy is found by those who are, are allowing that purification process and our intimacy just becomes deeper and deeper and deeper the more that we surrender and surrender and 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 become one with him and and the more of the chaff and the more of the um, the the falsehood, I guess, the things where we're placing our, our faith or our trust or whatever gets purged out of us, the cleaner we become. It's it's just elementary. So this generation of Jacob are ones that lay themselves on the altar. And verse two, though, which I'm just going to skip over here, but you can go read it, read, read, refresh yourself with Romans 12, verse one and two. It's really cool. Read it in the Amplified Version. But it says there in verse two, and then it talks about the renewing of the mind. But you, I don't believe the renewing of the mind can happen without the surrender. Sometimes we're after knowledge, we're after power, we're after just knowing more. And 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 the Bible actually says that knowledge without surrender is you you get puffed up, you you're full of pride. Knowledge does not serve you without intimacy. And so Paul is even giving us a blueprint here of the renewing of the mind has to begin with a surrendered heart. And so then what happens is when there's a surrendered heart. That word takes root in the heart and that word begins to plow the heart and to renew the mind. But then it says something really cool. In, um, it talks about not being fashioned after this age and, this, and, and um, the customs of this age. Well, what does that mean? I look then at Jeremiah and I look at the potter and the Lord says, go down to the potter's house and you will see how I deal with men. And we see it, it all culminates back to fire because the potter has to put the clay in the oven to 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 forge it and to make it a useful vessel so we see here that he uses language in romans 12 verse 2 of being fashioned after and conformed to this age well to me that means being molded like a like clay is on a wheel we are not to let the world and the and the uh, uh, the ideals of this age mold us like clay on a wheel and and the fires of this age harden our heart because fire hardens clay right so the bible says in isaiah that we are that to fear not okay to fear not for he is with us and he will harden us to difficulties it says that in the amplified version i wish i knew off the cuff where that was right this minute but isaiah 40 something i think or 50 something says that <laughs> sorry for my it's just coming off the top of my head but it used to be one of my favorite ones because the lord always used to speak to that to me you know when we go through trial and he's like anita i'm hardening you these trials are my fire but i'm hardening you to difficulties if you can handle my fire the fire of this world and this age 
is nothing compared to my fire because it's seven times hotter. My fire is a purifying fire. It's a refiner's fire. It's a purge and it's an empowering fire that we saw with the baptism of fire on the day of Acts. So his fire is hotter than the fire of the the trials and the and the circumstances of, and things that the devil can throw at us. And that's why it's so imperative that we do lay ourselves on the altar so that we are acquainted with his fire and with who he is, because he is an all-consuming fire. So we are acquainted with him. And then we are un, we are unmoved and unshaken and we are forged and, and we are hardened in his fire as clay to the enemy. But what happens is, is when we're fashioned and we're clay on the wheel of the world and we're being molded and moved and fashioned and formed and 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 then fired by the trials of this this age and we don't rely on God and we don't run to God and we don't get our mind renewed by God, but we actually, you know, get affected by the fire of this age, it hardens us to God. And so this whole process is what un, undoes all of those things. So then it says something really interesting in Romans chapter chapter 12, verse 2. It says this, it says, and then you will discern. And find out for yourself, this is Anita's paraphrase, but if you look at the Amplified, the will of God for you. So then we are able to discern where God is leading us and where he's not leading us. Thank you, Nancy. Isaiah 41.10. Where he is leading us and where he is not leading us. But when there's mixture, we, we we can't discern anything. And we're led astray by our emotions. We're led astray by fear. We're led astray by trauma that's residing in the heart. We're led astray by wounds. We're led astray by our own fleshly desires. We're led astray by all sorts of stuff. And so then when shaking comes, we can't discern and we don't know how to deal with it. So this is this is the blueprint of God, how he says, as a generation of seekers. Now, I know that's a lot come taken from Jacob, but that's what Jacob actually did with the wrestle. It was he overcame the flesh, the flesh, which was Esau's pursuit of Jacob against the blessing. He he said, I'm not letting go until you bless me. So I'm not I know that I can't deal with Esau tomorrow, God, without your favor and your anointing and your blessing on me. Because he knows that when God's blessing and favor is upon Jacob, that cannot be revoked by anything. So he had to wrestle through that. And prov- and that's why the Lord said, today your name is changed from deceiver, which is man of the flesh, really workers of the flesh. Jacob was a deceiver. He did it in his own strength. He tried to gain what was what what the blessing of the Lord, as we know, in his own strength. And sometimes we, we do that. We try and fulfill the, the word of God on our life in our own strength. But the wrestle has to engage. The fire has to come and purify our, our motives and our heart and why we do what we do. So that when we step into that authority of ruler, which Israel means when he got, got that name, we are surely then um, trustworthy with that authority and we possess. So they're a generation of Jacob. They seek him and see. And so this is a people who God is announcing in this hour. He is announcing a generation who seek him, who are sold out, who re- who know that they need him with requirement of necessity, who want to actually know him, like Paul said, which is the true prize, and not to know about him for selfish purposes and for knowledge to puffeth up. These are actually a generation that are going to lay themselves on the altar of sacrifice and allow the fire of God to come and purify them. And they're going to know him intimately. And the Bible says those who know their God will do mighty exploits. So they're a, they're a generation that not only seek him, but they're a generation that are going to walk in victory because of the position of the heart. So then, and, and he talks about seeking his face because, well, that's his presence. We know that in the Hebrew, seeking his face means to seek his presence. So that this is a generation uh, that will receive blessing from the Lord. I actually skipped verse five. Sorry about that. But and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is a generation of those who seek him, who inquire of him and who seek his face, O Jacob. So it, it's it's like this this generation of Jacob are pursuers of his presence. And this is this really matches in with Amos 9, 11, the re- restoration of the tabernacle of David, because a Davidic house is a, cent, a present centered house. 
And so if we are to be one with the rule of Messiah, whose government is is was op- established upon David's throne, then we have to be presence intimacy people. And so it all just comes back, you know, back to the same blueprint, which is intimacy, knowing God, lovers of God, and um, allowing the fire of God to purify the heart. So then it goes on. Now, remember it said, who has not lifted himself up to idols? In verse seven, it says, now lift up your heads, O ye gates. So he's talking about the correct lifting up. We've got to lift up our heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye age abiding doors, that the king of glory now may come in. Like we are the gates out of our belly. We are the gates of heaven on this earth. He said, out of your belly is going to flow rivers of living water. The Lord is not going to, I mean, I'm not talking about the second coming here. I'm talking about waging war in the earth for the nations of the earth, right? He's not going to come and wave a, wave a magic wand, as we know, and it's just going to poof things. He actually comes out of vessels that are purified and, and, and prepared. That's why John the Baptist said, I come to prepare the way of the Lord, that the glory of the Lord may be revealed in the earth. Wow. It's going to be revealed through the sons and daughters of God. And so those gates are going to, they're, they're going to be, because if you don't know intimacy, you're not going to know how to open your gate. And so the gates are knowing the presence of God and to release the rivers of God, which is kingdom. And so, because the kingdom of God's within us, we know that that's where the kingdom is. So, so who is, so li- so there's a lifting up. We have to lift ourselves up to him and, and, open up our gates and be lifted up you age abiding doors i really believe that means lifting up jesus who is the age abiding door and all men will be drawn unto him instead of lifting up all these other things that have gone in the past seasons and past decades of lifting up organizations and lifting up you know our agendas and our our assignments and missions and all of this kind of thing but if we lift jesus up simply all men will be drawn unto him. And this is how God possesses nations. This is the blueprint to possess nations. And so he says here, uh, then then he begins to say the king of glory may come in. So he's starting to begin to reveal now how are we going to take nations because we need a manifestation of his face in a certain way. And, And it's only born from that space of fire. So then he goes, who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. So we see that there's going to be a battle. That why would he why would he announce himself as the Lord mighty in battle if there's no battle? So we know that he's going to come as a Lord of hosts. He said, lift up your, he says it again, lift up your heads or your gates. Lift them up, you age abiding doors that the king of glory may come in. Who then is this king of glory, the Lord of hosts? So he's the captain, he's the boss. He's the king of glory, Salah. Pause and think about that. So in the Amplified Version, it says that. So we see that we're entering a battle. We see that the King of Glory, when he is the captain of the host, when he is at the command and he is in charge, he never leads us into a battle that we won't win. If we are one with him and he is one with us and we ride with the King of Glory, we're the ones lifting open the gates that he may come in, then the King of Glory will lead us into battle. And I've had Revelation 19 on my on my heart, on my grid in the last since November. And the Lord's been speaking to me about Revelation 19 and how he will judge the harlot, the um the the harlot, meaning the fake. I really believe that means the fake and and the counterfeit. And he's going to expose the counterfeit. And and it says that it, it the smoke of of that comes up to the Lord. Well he's going to deal with it with fire. And and the thing is though it's, he then talks about the the bride of how he he clothes the saints with the right uh, the white linen which is the righteous acts of the saints, and so now we're starting to see a picture here of the white linen um, being the righteous acts of the saints. So we're talking. Let's go back and talk about hands, which are actions, which is works, which is what we do. Our works are not to be from any other place other than faith. The righteous acts of the saints, well, righteous acts of faith, born of God, again, from the secret place, not having good ideas and saying, God bless it, or, or not having a new thing and a new, and, and, you know, our strategies look so smart sometimes, but with this new season, with, there's going to require, as I said before, such a level of surrender we've never known. And we cannot move unless he moves. We cannot go unless he says go. We, we're going to have, there has to be such a greater discipline I believe in his people in this hour than we've ever known before to win this war. And, and, and 
it is going to require uh, to to have discipline requires surrender to it, it requires to wait on him and and to wait on him in the hebrew actually means to become one with him and and to become one with his mind to become one with his thoughts and to become one with his ways we can sometimes want his will but we don't understand his ways to get to the will and so god is really about revealing i've had jeremiah 6 16 on my heart for so long returning to the ancient paths that that's where we'll find rest in other words rest means by his spirit we're going to do things out of his by his spirit not by our own strength and so and so with these righteous acts of the saints and then he goes on and if you read revelation 19 he talks about this uh the 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 battle that that he, that he, the captain of the hosts uh leads the armies of heaven and then he talks about the marriage supper of the lamb and he starts to begin to say get this that the food at the banqueting table is the victory of the plunder it's mind blowing. So, but I don't want to focus on that. But if you want to go go read that again, that it's pretty cool because this righteous acts of the saints is what is is the clothing, the, the 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 white linen is the purified, um, I guess, as the Bible says, the bride has made herself ready. It talks about that I think in Revelation nineteen as well. She's made herself ready. She has offered herself as a living sacrifice on the altar. She has allowed the fire of God to come. She has taken responsibility and made herself ready like in that space and surrendered to the refiner's fire and, and the fullest soap, Malachi 3. And, and so that, that purification process can be fulfilled. Now, what I want to go, what I, I want to go to, and we've been going 50 minutes. So I just want to finish. Well, we'll see how we, we've got probably another half an hour maybe um, in this, in this next space. But I want to talk about what this clean hands and a pure heart is, because unless we understand it, we sometimes enter into striving again, trying to to understand what this clean hands and a pure heart is. But scripture always explains scripture. So let's go to James chapter four. And um, it's a pretty heavy passage. It's a pretty, James didn't mess around. He didn't mince his words. He was pretty direct. And, and I feel like the body of Christ in this hour needs it straight we need we don't have time to, to to have the fluffy kind of coax us into stuff we need it we need it um the truth is what sets us free and the truth is what leads us into 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 freedom so um james here was was <laughs> interestingly enough james was actually talking to the jewish convert christians here so as we know and um which to me, when I when I read James four, sometimes it feels like he's talking to the world, really. Um, but he's not. He's talking to his brothers and sisters in Christ, as James chapter two verse one says. Believers, he's addressing the believers. But I like how Charles Swindle um, debriefs the book of James a little bit. And I'm just going to share that first before we delve into it. But the Charles Swindle's debrief of James was, he says. James contended that faith produces authentic deeds. So remember, we're talking about the righteous acts of the saints. In other words, if those who call themselves God's people truly belong to him, their lives will produce deeds or fruit. In language and themes that sound similar to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, James rails against the hypocritical believer who says one thing but does another. Now, remember, Psalm 24 talks about not lifting ourselves up to falsehood, to idols, to count the counterfeit. So then it goes on. He says, more than any other book in the New Testament, more than any other book in the New Testament, James places the spotlight on the necessity for believers to act in accordance with their faith. So in other words, not to be hypo- hypocritical. How well do our actions mirror the faith that we proclaim? So, um, so so what he's dealing with in chapter four of James, what what James is dealing with, he's dealing with mixture in the believer. And so this is what Psalm 24 is all about, dealing with mixture so that we can enter into victory. And, and so he deals with, um, let's have a look. Let's go into James four. We're going to go there. James chapter four. 
Let's start at verse one and let's just go down. Let's get context. So what leads to strife? I'm going to let, read out the Amplified version. It is a bit long-winded, but or the Amplified classic, but I do like how he, he kind of brings it out. What leads to strife, discord, and feuds? And how do conflicts, quarrels, and fightings originate among you? Do they not arise from your sensual desires that are ever warring in your bodily members? So he's speaking about the flesh, obviously. You are jealous and covet what others have and your desires go unfulfilled. So you become murderers. To hate is to murder as far as your hearts are concerned. You burn with envy and anger and are not able to obtain the gratification and the contentment and the happiness you seek. So you fight and you war. You do not have because you do not ask. Or you do ask God for them and yet fail to receive because you ask with wrong purpose and evil selfish motives. So he's really dealing with the heart here. Your intention is when you get what you desire, you spend it in sensual pleasures. He's really just exposing how the flesh operates. That's what he's doing. And then he says, he's addressing them. And he says, you are like unfaithful wives having illicit love affairs with the world and breaking your marriage vow to God. Do you not know that being the world's friend is being God's enemy? So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world takes his stand as an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that the scripture is speaking to no purpose that says the spirit whom he has caused to dwell in us yearns over us and he yearns for the spirit with a jealous love. But he gives us more and more grace to meet this evil tendency and all others fully. So now he's giving us the way out, the answer, obviously, right? That is why he says, God sets himself against the proud and haughty, but gives grace to the humble. So now he's just basically plainly telling us that it's pride. That's the issue here. And But grace, the, the, the very thing that we need uh, is 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 humility is the position in order to get it right then he says so be subject to god resist the devil stand firm against him and he will flee come close to god this is where i'm getting to the point but i wanted to bring it in context come close to god and he will come close to you recognize you as sinners get your soiled hands clean realize that you have been disloyal wavering individuals with divided interests and purify your hearts. So now he's he's speaking of what Psalm 24 talks about, clean hands and pure heart. But we need to know the context of how our hands get soiled and our hearts get defiled. Because if we don't understand that, then we don't know what that purification process looks like. So basically he's saying, God is going to, in order to deal with your, clean, to clean your hands, He's, ask, he's actually telling us to clean our hands and to purify our own hearts. That is the altar sacrifice, okay? That's the surrender to the fire, right? So we have that responsibility. He's saying you have to clean your hands and you have to purify your hearts. Now, what it is is he begins, he before that, he was actually, let me just go down here. He was actually talking about becoming a friend to the world. And he's talking about, um, he's talking about where, you know, clean your hands, you sinners. That's what he, he said to them. In other words, you're missing the mark. You're not walking in faith because sin means to miss the mark. It's, and faith means to hit the target. So you're not walking in faith. You're not, you're not, um, you're not, you're not, your actions, your deeds are not being born from a place of faith, from intimacy. And faith can only be born in intimacy. But your actions are coming from a fleshly space. And so you need to clean this because he then before that, he talks about um, the ways of the world and he's talking about being a friend of the world. Well, what that actually means is, is to be harmonious. So to be in agreement with. So God wants to break us. Repentance means to break agreement and to change our mind. So God wants us to, to, to untether ourselves from agreement and being harmonious with the ideals of this age, with the wisdom of this age, with the way that the world does things, with the ways of the flesh, right? With being driven by the flesh, with the fruits of the flesh. Um, and this is what he who has clean hands and a pure heart's about. So it, it's, um, it's the ways of God will always lead us to deal with the flesh. 
all of these sensual things that James was talking about, the war that's going on, the jealousy, the contention, the coveting, the the strife between one another, the the um, asking but not receiving um, because the motive and the heart's wrong. So all of this stuff, but he gives us answers the whole way through. And he says, you know, um, stop putting your hand to things that are not born of faith. Stop. Well, what, we put our hands to things that aren't born of faith because they're coming from a wrong motive. They're coming from, you know, um, whatever whatever motive it could be from, which we could unpack a hundred. But is it from wounds? Is it from needing? Is it from identity? Is it from um, an orphan place? Is it from just pride in general? You know, just needing to have that um, self, you know, I guess finding our identity in our own and our worth in our own achievements. And that's all the stuff God's dealing with in this hour. He's going after it. And, and we might think we're all holier than now. We've been Christians a hundred years and we've been around the block a hundred years and we've been in ministry a hundred years. And But no one's exempt. No one's exempt from this process. He's bringing the body of Christ as one into this space of purification because he's he's wanting to level us all up into a space of victory and, and into a space where the King of glory is at our helm. And so we look at that with the hands and then he says, you purify your hearts of being div having divided interests. In other words, being double-minded. So it goes back to faith again. It goes back to putting our trust in one thing on one minute, we're going to believe this. And then the next minute, we're going to believe that. Then he says something really horrific and we could get offended by it. But he says, you know, you have to cleanse yourself from your spiritual adultery. And I had a dream recently, which really kind of put the fear of God in me. And that's another, that's another topic. I really believe that through this whole purification process that the Lord is bringing his body through, there is a return of the fear of the Lord like we've never seen because we're going to need the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is essential for his presence. Like you don't have his presence without having the fear of the Lord. It's we saw David, we tried to we saw David mess with that and and it didn't go well for him. We saw David try and return the presence of God, the ark of God, the word, you know, the word and the presence um, you know, to to Jerusalem on an ark on a uh, on a wagon the ark on a wagon and we saw how that went for him so that was a very irreverent it was it was lacking the fear of god and we saw uza which means the hand of strength reach out and try and touch god's presence that which was holy and it was dead he was struck dead and so so at the thresh and, and it was actually at the threshing floor that this striking uza dead happened because the oxen stumbled at the threshing floor so we see this 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 presence of god this this pursuit of God's presence, which David had. He was a man after God's own heart. But God dealt with David. God dealt with him and said, you know, at the threshing, what, what I blinked at before, I'm not going to blink at anymore. And, and I brought the house of God to the threshing floor. And my ark is not going to go on a wagon. My presence is going to be revered and it's going to have the rightful awe that it's meant to have. And in that space where awe and fear of God is re restored and returned, there we're going to see a victorious, mighty church come forth because they are going to know they're going to be reverent of, of the of the of the awe of God and who God is. And at, in that reverence is actually going to fuel power. That reverence is actually going to fuel the might of God in the earth. It just will. But but without that reverence, the might of God is not displayed. That's why the Lord is saying. My blueprint to the might of God, which is the king of glory coming in, must start with clean hands and pure hearts because you're not going to get the might of God without it. And so all the, all the heart even to pursue God's presence. Some people aren't even interested in God's presence. And that's the, the house of Saul. You know, the very first thing David did when he came back into office, well, came in, not back into, came into office of government over Israel, not just over Judah, but when he was anointed over the house of whole of Israel, the very first act he did was to bring the ark out of hibernation or wherever it was, because he said the ark was not sought in the days of Saul. Saul represents a government led by the flesh, a, a house that is only interested in the works of the dead works of religion or the works of the flesh, pleasing people, pleasing man and not pleasing God. But David was a man after God's own heart, even though he made mistakes and he messed up, but he was still after, he was after, he knew that the presence was relationship. He was after that intimate place of relationship. He said, don't take your presence from me, God. You can, you know, create in me a clean heart. See, the heart is related to the presence. 
Can you see how all the way through creating me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit with me, but take not your presence from me. So there's it, it, David was just always in pursuit of his presence. And the thing is, it's not our job to refine ourselves. It, it, you know, James does say, cleanse your hands and cleanse your hearts. That Our job is to repent. That's how we, we cleanse our hands and our hearts. We repent. We say, okay, God, you're revealing something here, but it's the refiner's fire that reveals it. So we don't run around trying to fix ourselves, and we don't run around striving, trying to, oh, I need this purified, that purified. The Bible says in Malachi 3 that Jesus sits as the refiner's fire. So we let him be the refiner. And that refiner's fire brings to the surface that which he knows is an enemy of your heart and an enemy of intimacy and, and an enemy of victory. And so we let him do it in his order. We, you know, sometimes we're, we're about going, well, God, I want you to deal with this. But he's like, well, no, that's, I want to deal with that. Well, how about we don't worry about that, but we deal with this. You know, sometimes we think we know better with, than God, but the, the, the fact of the matter is he's the refiner, but our job is when he brings that to the, to the surface, even if it's a wound, we need to forgive roots of bitterness, um, jealousy, contention, strife, areas of, of orphanness in our heart where, where our identity still is forming and we're still getting this whole, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and he is my righteousness where we still get, I think that's a process. I don't think that ever just lands on us. I think that as the heart is dealt with, we, we surrender the heart more and more into his righteousness, meaning he's worthy and his worth is enough for us. We don't need to try and find our worth outside of him. That's that's what that means. So all of these things, the refiner fire brings to the surface. And these all these things are enemies of faith. They're all enemies of our ability to believe him. They're all enemies of our ability to trust him. And faith, we can't do it without faith. So that's our new covenant, grace and faith. And that's why James is addressing faith throughout the whole book of James. It has to be pure. It can't be dead works. Faith without works is dead. It can't be dead faith. It can't be just blabbing it and and don't and and he and he says to them, you know, you can't be, you know, just hearers of the word. You've got to be doers of the word. So James is really dealing with the house of God. And I really feel like we're in a book of James season. We really are. And a book of Hebrews season where God is dealing with his house. And even Peter, Peter's another one. And and those three books are, are essential for the fires of God and how he matures us and brings us into that maturity of faith. And, and the maturity of faith is really that, that um, overcoming. So, you know, James is saying there, you know, about being spiritual adulterers and, 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 and what we do is we just repent and we say, okay, I, I choose to disagree with this, with this behavior, this lie. I choose to, to I, ref, I choose to disagree with going this way anymore. And so you change direction. That's what repentance means. But, but in that, I had this dream going back to spiritual adultery. I had this dream. When was it? Oh, within the last six months, I think. And in the dream, the Lord showed me without, it was a long dream. And within, I'm just going to condense it. I'll just tell you the meaning of the dream. But in the dream, the Lord was revealing to me how unbelief works. And unbelief is actually stubbornness. And it's actually a choice not to, it's pride. It's root, completely rooted in pride. And that's why the Lord you know, in Hebrews three was talking to them about not hardening their hearts like the children of Israel, but to hear the voice of the Lord and not harden their hearts as the Israelites did. And, um, and, and they harden themselves into rebellion. And so whatever's not a faith is rebellion. It's as simple as that. Um, and the Lord and rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, which is spiritual adultery as well as works of the flesh. So it's all, you know, we super spiritualize all these things. But the thing is, the works of the flesh is witchcraft. And God is purging his church of witchcraft. It's 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 spiritual adultery. It's operating like Saul did from another avenue, another gateway, which is the flesh. He went to the witch of Endor to try and access the word of the Lord. And so God is, I mean, I know this sounds heavy, but the thing is, God is dealing with his house to not mess with the gifts of the spirit and to not mess with um you know operating with the word in 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 from a soulish space and i've to be honest i've seen a lot of the prophetic realm operating in mixture 
and and it's and God's purifying this mess. He's purifying this stuff in this hour, because if the if the lighthouses are dim and all not leading the way, then we're going to end up on the rocks. We're going to our faith is going to be shipwrecked. You know, with the prophetic light in our own life, not just the prophets. We know that we're all got access to the prophetic realm now as sons and daughters. That's given to us. We're going to end up. Our faith is going to be shipwrecked if this light is not pure. The, you know, and and so the light has to be pure. That the ability to discern what is right and what is wrong has to be pure. Otherwise, um, we don't. You know, we don't know if we're fashioned after the spirit of this age. We're going to listen to a spirit of antichrist, and we're not going to listen to the true spirit of 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 God. And so James is talking about the spirit of this age. He's talking about the spirit of the world. He's like your friends of the world. Don't agree with the doctrines of this age, which is the flesh. And and we can have it. It's leaven. We've got it in the church. It's it's contamination that is acting like it's God, but it's not. It's leaven. And and it's it's hypocrisy and and it's um and, and leaven feeds the flesh. Anything that exalts the flesh is leaven. Any doctrine that leads us away from faith and trust in God because faith is not faith unless we have to trust God with everything we have. And so any doctrine that comforts the flesh and tells us that we can rely on our own strength and we can do things in our own way and and we don't need to, you know, ask God and it's super spiritual to be doing this and it's, you know, legalistic or religious to do that. That's leaven. And God is saying in this hour, we've got to be aware of leaven and not to be friends of the world. And so that's where our hearts get defiled. And the lamp, he says, is in the heart. If if our lamp is dim, then gross is that darkness. We won't be able to see where we're going. So, but, you know, um, so spiritual adultery is actually unbelief. It is, it is choosing not to uh, believe the truth, resisting God. Um, or not wanting to surrender to the altar and the fire process. And sometimes it's in all of our hearts. It's it's hard, rocky areas that are in our hearts that have come through the hardening of the world at us where we've either been wounded or hurt and things that haven't been dealt with that have hardened us. And so God needs to, you know, break that hardness down and it has to come through surrender. So it takes humility to believe God sometimes because we want him to do what we want him to do when we want him to do it. But God's God. And this is where the reverence comes back and to be what people who walk by faith. Um, we've got to be ones that are humble and surrendered to God in every way. And we will be able to believe him at the, in, in the midst of a storm, in the midst of absolute chaos We'll be able to see through it and we'll be able to see the promise. We'll be able to see hope. We'll be able to see that, you know, otherwise, if we're fashioned and formed after this age and if we're friends of the world, all we're going to see is what's going on around us and we're going to fall and crumble in a moment. But the shakings that are coming are going to require clean hands and a pure heart to get victory in. And, And I just believe that the word of the Lord in this hour for the church and the body of Christ is an invitation to the altar of Romans 12 verse 1 a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God and Malachi 3 is the burning message of this hour as well that um, who can endure the day of his coming because he stands as a refiner's fire and a full of soap there is a day of his coming and it is now and it is the refining fire and we are to stand in it we're to endure it we're not to run away from it we're to just let it let the the intimacy pursuit of God just deal with our heart and purify us so that we can actually see th- as he sees. You know, we have this saying, oh, God's ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. Hey, we're in the new covenant. We have access to know God's ways and to see the higher ways. But the the access point is surrender um, and it's the altar so that it burns up all of the mixture that clouds our vision from seeing the way of God, because if we're formed after this world, the way of God looks ludicrous and the way of God looks crazy. So we have to be purified from being friends with the world and we have to break agreements, all agreements of being harmonious with the wisdom of this age. That's what being friends of the world means. We're to break agreement with being harmonious with those things 
And then we're going to have eyes to see. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We, you know, those Beatitudes, we, we, we just go over that one. Blessed are the pure in heart is the word of the Lord for this season, because we need to see where God is. We need to see what God's doing. We need to have eyes of faith and eyes of wisdom to know the ways of God. So blessed, that's why we're blessed. We're blessed with those who have pure hearts, those that have surrendered to the, to the refiner's fire and, and to this process of cleansing and repentance of cleansing ourselves from all spiritual adultery where our hearts have been yoked and trusting other things, little or big. They could be minute, minute, but God's going after our heart and because he's a jealous, jealous lover. So that's what I feel like is on my heart and I feel like um, that I've been able to deliver you to, to you today. I feel like, you know, that's it in a nutshell. I hope that I made sense to everybody. But, um, yeah, be blessed. That was awesome. That was awesome. I'm sure everybody got a lot out of that. I did. Thank you so much, Anita. And it's funny, I'm, I've got to go and deliver a word at, right after this. And it's so similar to what I'm going to be talking about. <laughs> I'm thinking I just take you with me. <laughs> <laughs> it's the word of the hour, Nancy. That's right. I love it. I love it. And it's a hard word, but it's such a good, powerful word. Let me just open this up for comments and questions. Um, anybody living in that right now? Anybody you're ministering to? Anything, any comments? Because I know... Uh, this this is a word to take with you today. Just open it up. Just unmute and just start talking. Comments, questions. Jorge, go ahead. You have, you have something. I know you got something. George, you got something? Thank you so much, Dr. Anita. It was really beautiful and very powerful. And I love how the Lord is speaking you know, I did a word for this year that's coming out soon that talks about his beautiful tapestry of overlapping confirmations from different prophetic voices in many lands. And I'm just overwhelmed and in awe of the Lord of how he's speaking. And I put in there Psalm 24, the Amos and other uh, verses that you quoted. And it's just like, yeah, and that just gives me the, that that proving knowledge God is real. The Holy Spirit is speaking and we are hearing and we just need to rise up with courage and boldness and unabashed faith, knowing that we have access into the very throne room of God because of the blood of Jesus, his death, burial and resurrection, and that he needs us to step up into our place. And, you know, many have felt that we should be farther along as the body, as the bride, as the remnant of Christ, the ecclesia, farther along than we are, because we need to step up, man up, woman up, to take our place in our supernatural identity. So this is just further uh, confirmation, and, and you deliver it with such a articulation and tying it together in such a... Wait, George, you muted yourself. <laughs> He got so excited. <laughs> I got so excited. I said, oh, I'm just silent before the Lord. <laughs> he's, he's overwhelming. I don't know how that happened. I was with my hands around. I must have done it with my elbow. Um, but that's beautiful, Anita. Thank you so much. And we're looking forward to seeing you Wednesday night at the at the CMM house here in Fort Mill. So I'll, I'll be quiet and let others speak because I know the Lord is touching everyone. Thank I think you. Karen's bursting with something, don't, aren't you, Karen? Well, I think I've got a word coming forth from you, but I don't know what it is, but I know it's there. But I, I want to say, um, before I go there, I really love what you said about um, that the access point to the higher ways is surrender. Because so often we presume... <laughs> And um, I've, I've been in ministry a lot of years, and it's really easy to presume that we have the word of the Lord. And when you were talking about the mixture and the prophetic and the problems that are going on, I think that we need to turn that for good and take that as a lesson to us to one, be sure we're walking rightly, because if we open ourselves up, we can fall into deception and think we have a word from God and it is not. 
And we need to test as a body, we need to test the words that are coming out from others. And um, at the last election season, I think that was a challenge to us to test the words that were coming out because they were a really big mixture. And we as a body, the Lord wants to mature us in this. He's bringing forth a mature bride. A mature bride will test the words. A mature bride will discern. So, but um, let me shift here, Anita. I want to say that you have really come up. I don't know if I've heard you share since you shared your doctorate. What's that been, two, three years ago? When did you graduate? 21, did I? Yep, I think Was it so. 21? Oh, not yeah, no. I think a lot of the people in the class don't know. I, Nancy didn't say. And, and Anita was in our class <laughs> a few years ago and graduated. And you did really well. She did a really good job. And I remember, uh, and I've heard you speak at a couple of other times, but this is at a higher level. The Lord has been bringing you up. And sometimes as we're ascending the higher levels, we're feeling the movement of the step up and we don't really realize that we've come up and that it's really the work of the spirit bringing us up. And I'm really seeing that on you. I want to encourage you tremendously. I'm, I'm seeing um, greater depths in the word. I'm seeing greater depths and and um, greater clarity in your communication. I'm I'm just seeing an overall coming up, and so I really want to encourage you. And Anita Bryant, Anita Bryant, whoa, that's a weird word. What, what was I, that? Was she an actress? Who's Anita Bryant? I didn't plan to say Anita Bryant. That Anita, came out really Anita, weird. Anita Bryant was a former Miss America, and then an actress and a spokesperson. A she, spokesperson. Oh, she, she was, was some, she was a Christian spokesperson, wasn't she? Did she speak out? Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I think that's why that came out because I see you as a bridge, and that's really weird that I said Anita Bryant, but I think it has to do with being a spokesperson. You're you're not an actress. I don't I don't see that on you at all. But I do remember that she was a spokesperson for a period of time. And there's a time when God gives a particular message or a particular word. And and I see you, wow, I see you like on an arched bridge, but you're at the top. And when you speak it out, it goes out this way instead of just being on one side or the other. Um, it's like you're speaking. It's it's like you're speaking to two groups, to to two the words going out to two groups. And I I don't think that's two nations, but it might be two groups in the body. Because, you know, in the body, we have, oh, I, you know, we might not say I was baptized by Paul or I was baptized by Apollos. We have our, I follow yeah. this or yeah. I follow that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I think there's, um, I know exactly what that means. There's coming a word that God's going to give to you and it's going to go out to multiple groups. I'm not going to even limit that to two because I think yeah. he's saying more. Yeah. Um, he's saying more. Anita, that your word's going to go out to multiple groups and he's preparing hearts to receive what he has to say through you. <laughs> Just be blessed and be encouraged that he is with you and he's preparing the way before you. I see him going before you. I see him throwing seed out before you. As you're following him, he's throwing the seed out. He's preparing the soil. That he's that he's sending you out to but i also see this this word of the bridge and that he's put you up there where it can go out further than if you were just on one side or on the other I, i'm not sure if that yep. makes a lot of sense it to you does. but i believe he'll bring Great that sense. clarity to you awesome okay. thank you bless that totally you. makes sense and thank you for sharing it's well, so good to see you bless you thank you, you. Thank you for your i think the, the two levels or multiple levels really anita is it's like speaking in a parabolic language like Jesus did. You know, a child could understand it and somebody who is very mature and not overly intellectually, carnally um, a scholar could understand it if their spirit was open to the surrendered life and a lifestyle of repentance. Yeah, great. And could you I, I, wanted, I wanted to add a little bit to the um, Anita Bryant thing. She was from Florida. She was a beauty queen and she was um, a Christian and she was pretty outspoken. Um, and we loved her. I was from Florida 
and and she was well loved and she was very popular in the country and then she crossed the gay right when the gay crowd was really bloss beginning to be really just beginning to blossom if you can call it blossom um beginning to get better known and she found herself in the crosshairs of a huge um social battle really and there were people that loved her and people that did not like her and we uh, we obviously were for her she was the i think it was the orange juice queen or something like that um but she she was well loved by the state and then found herself in this really political social crosshairs that was a really ugly fight and you know people were dissing her loving her and everything in between so when you said Anita Bryant, Karen, that's what went through my head. Um, was that took me back? I don't know how many years, but that was quite the. Um, she was she became like a um, what do you call it when some a there's a, plumb, a what plumb line a plumb line. Yes, she became a plumb line. She really did. So I don't you know, know if that's there's, prophetic. There's more thing, to but. that on the Anita Bryant because before you said it, I was suddenly remembering the orange juice commercials. And Bob Jones gave a word, and I wondered about this word, but the Lord taught me a lot through it. Bob Jones gave a word that oranges represent love. If you look in scripture, when he talks about you're the apple of my eye and things like that, I've seen apple representing love because of scripture. So Bob says that oranges represent love. And her, Lord, I, I don't understand that except that you gave it to him. And I really believe that this man of God heard from you. So I choose to, to receive that they also represent. I didn't set aside apples as representing love, but, but that they also. And I, I think part of this Anita Bryant word is that God, whoa, God represents himself on the earth through his children. And Anita, I believe that you are going to be known as a representative of the love of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Be encouraged in that. I mean, yeah. You know what, going, going into this, um, when you talk about, Emily, you just put in the chat some great stuff. You talked about persecution. And isn't that part of the, the cleansing that as a lot of us are going through different persecutions right now? And I know a lot of you guys are. Um, I certainly know I'm I'm getting hit. I know that what that is, is, is part of that thing. So um, um, let me switch gears really quick too. Um, in the body of Christ right now, there are I heard somebody talking about this, that there are different levels, of course, of people. We're in all different places, right? And so not everybody is in that place of consecration and purification. And so there are they gonna are they gonna make cuts? Are they gonna make cuts? Yeah, some yeah, they're gonna make cuts, but it's but they've chosen a different way. Um, will they be ruling and reigning? I mean, I've heard people talk about that and different things, but it's, you, you wonder and you look at people and it's easy when you're going through to think, oh, you know, why is my life so hard? Why am I doing all this? And that person is so successful, having a great, happy, clappy life. And, you know, they live and they die and whatever, but it's because it's a different, it's a different place in Christ. And so, um, we just cannot, those who compare themselves by themselves are not wise. We just cannot do that. And so it is our individual walk and that's the hard place. Um, so I think as we're listening to all of these words, we have to, um, we have to understand what part is ours and then look at other people. We cannot judge other people. Right. And that's the hard part, you know, cause we're, people were leading, people were teaching may not, they may not, they they may stop at uh, the bottom of the mountain, like uh, like um, uh, Rick Joyner talked about in the final quest. I mean, that might be, and that's fine. It's like wherever they're supposed to be, right? Yeah, but I do. I I feel like this is a word for those that will lead because that's right. That's right. yeah, it's definitely um, the Davids, the Davidic house that God has to reestablish that um, right order, so that um, the others, like the yeah, the young ones, aren't contaminated from the leaven yeah yeah it's it's a crucial word um but but just you know i guess i was thinking i was seeing the different different people yes that, nancy yes 100 percent. i understand what you're saying 100 percent. it's just hard okay jump in everybody um go ahead emily thank you anita i mean there's so many things that you said that are in line with a friend of mine who had a conversation today one of the things we had discussed was um 
how, uh, you know, um, you said the ark had to go before because we've never been this way before. And this is spiritually true. But when you look at the natural of our country, yeah. you look at our country, America, and you look at other places in the world. I mean, my husband's getting ready to retire. And we were just having this conversation. You used to could work hard and um, plan your life, you know, walk with the Lord and do all these things and all these things underneath you underneath you that were built on godly principles within a government were established to where if you planned well and you did well it was like one and one is two you didn't have the government math to where uh you know another trillion dollars in debt in a hundred days so just print more money i mean you didn't have all of this crazy math you didn't have all of these things because um <laughs> And, and I don't think that's like having a religious spirit. That was just people who knew how to walk in wisdom, build a country a sound way. So talking about the art going before, we've got to really get back behind that arc and reestablish those places. And in our own individual lives, we have to hear clearly what to do and about the shaking. I was, we were having this conversation and she was saying, yes, yes. It's like, oh my gosh, it's like so much has happened. And I'm talking about personally, this thing, this thing, that thing, just, just stuff. And I think like when God is removing the child from us and he's shaking us, it's like, Lord, I really thought I was committed. But then all of a sudden yep. I see there's some major changes, some major things the Lord is showing in my life, some major things. And we talked about it being a war, you know, sometimes we just want to go home and have a sip of cocoa and eat the chocolate chip cookies, but we are all the time in a state of war. So, um, but the the other thing I I I loved how you talked about the the pure in heart and the hands, and I loved how you talked about Jacob, because you know Jacob was a deceiver, and he was someone that God told originally that He was going to use him, but then his Jacob's first vow to God it started with a if and I just realized this a couple of years ago and he is saying if and if okay he says then God made a vow promise saying if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey and I and that I take and will give me food to eat and clothing to wear and if he grants that I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. And this is right. This is right after the latter experience. You know, this is right after he had um, deceived Esau. Then the Lord shows in the latter. But then he doesn't say, OK, I see that this is you, God. And he says, if. But then God takes some father on and God delivers, delivers him from his father-in-law. And then he wrestles with God. So to me, this, his whole life is just a process of how we can be sometimes. God reveals himself to us, but, you know, Jacob says, if, then I will serve you. And see, I, I think there can be danger in that because God is God, but God didn't mind that because God kept on going with him. God knew his heart. God was willing to prove himself to him. And it reminds me of when Abraham um, interceded with the um people in um Sodom and Gomorrah he said but God just one more time if you so so I think God he knows our hearts and he knows where we are but but I had never seen that Jacob said if God but then God again shows I will do this and I will do this and I will do this but God we know that God has already answered our ifs but it just shows a great hope for people who who may have felt like they have deceived this and messed this and messed this all up, that God is still there if we'll wrestle with God in our hearts and let him lead us, he'll he'll just keep on fighting with us. So anyway, I I, I, I just found that very interesting. Good word. Good word. Right. It's great. Keep jumping in. Anybody else have something they want to share? Um so may I or, or um let's see who was it? Allison, did you have something? I think I think Clarion um, has something too somewhere like Clarion yeah. goes on there. Look, they're just I can just look at them and see they got something. But go ahead, Allison. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nita. Um, I'm coming over to Queensland in June. Hope you're home. <laughs> Might connect. Yeah, <laughs> um, it, never mind. Um, I came home from Queensland 
and on Friday. And it was like God was saying to me, I want you to fast for 21 days, which is exactly what I'm doing now. And it was for all those reasons that you've just explained. I'm not, tr I'm trying to, I don't want to brag or anything, but it was just the, it was like there's been a real um, importance that this is what I have to do. And I presented it to our group of people on Sunday night. Some want to enter in, others don't. Um, so, you know, you've got your different um, levels, as you said, and it just clarified so much for me, really, in so many ways. Um, you know, and, and I've been, over the holidays, I've really been crying out to God, you know, for the cleansing and the cleansing of our gates, you know, your eyes and your ears and your heart and then your inner, inner gates and then your holy of holy gates. And just so that's, you know, what I'm starting to move through now. Um, you know, and, and I firmly believe, well, I'm guilty too of having a mixture. I'm guilty of having an antichrist witchcraft spirit in me, a mocking spirit and a, and a mammon spirit. I'm guilty of all of these. And I think that, you know, we all have a level of this within us. And so... For me, it's been imperative that I go through this cleansing process because, you know, we need to move into that place of ruling and reigning over ourselves and over yeah. the body of Christ, over, you know, um, so like I run a fellowship. Well, you know, you've got incidences that come in and, um, you know, we've got to get those strategies from God through that place of intimacy because we can't if we if we do it on our own um and in our own fleshly ways inevitably we stuff up well I do anyway and yes. you know <laughs> and it doesn't come out right but if I've got God's yeah. you know coming from that place of intimacy I can deal with so much more yes. and now that I haven't got David with me um, I really need to be walking in such intimacy and such oneness with God so that I can move forward and move our group of people into the same place and, you know, for that place of victory. You know, it's yeah. all about God. It's not about through fasting and praying. It's all about who God is in your life. And you've brought that out so clearly. That you brought out that you know we've got a holy God mm. and he is after our hearts and our hearts alone and this yeah I believe this is just it's been really really good um and God is a jealous God and we have lost the fear of the Lord I totally agree with that that in the you know you hear of all sorts of things going on in the church and you think Oh my gosh, you know, I I just we have to have that fear of God. And um one thing I'm bringing in um or this Thursday for the next couple of Thursdays is is just a time of starting about six o'clock at night and going through to whenever, just a time of absolute praise and worship and getting our hearts back focused on the sound and the frequency and the so, vibration of, of God and the sound of his voice and the sound of resonating and becoming one with him. So yeah. thank you for that, Anita. It was really good. Yeah, bless you. It's interesting when you just mentioned that, about the frequency and the sound of the God since, um, like I've had it for a little while, but it's really, really coming out a lot since I've been here in America um, this last few weeks that this is really the word of the Lord that there is a new sound and mm. to be um the sound of the Lord like in in physical worship but just his voice and mm. and 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 being um in tune to this sound um of the Lord and and I really believe that in the worship there's going to be a greater intimacy even in that in an intercessory yeah. more style of worship 
a throne room worship than just, you know mm. what I mean? Like, so there is a new sound definitely coming forth. Mm. Uh, yeah. That's good. So, mm. mate, you got something. Uh, yeah. I just want to say, Renny, thank you for the thing that she shared today. Uh, it was really amazing, too. I definitely agree with that. Uh, uh, um, I just want to add a little thing. I think also this is also a season for for us to also understand as a church, humility is very important to recognize our mistake is very, very important. And most of the time also, I think uh, we forget the power of this, the power saving, the power of the blood of Jesus. We think that that power is only when we are not believer, when we are sinner and we come to him. That's the moment that this power the blood of Jesus can wash away at that season. And sometimes it happens when something greater happens during our walk as a Christian. We kind of like think that power is not still the same. That power still has the ability and the capacity to Amen. bring us back to God at any given moment. Amen. But sometimes because of teaching, some of the people, wrong teaching has came. And we think because we are this army of God, when God does something, he rejects us as his children. It's not true. The Bible yeah. says, for whom the Lord loved, he, ch he chases and scatter every son whom he received. It's normal. When God brings some of the things, it's for good correction. And it's okay sometimes if human beings are not seeing you because of a mistake. I like to say to people, those who knew Peter, when he was following Jesus, before he denied Jesus, are different than those who met Peter when he denied Jesus because they don't know nothing about the work of Peter. They don't know Peter was a loving man. He loved Jesus. He always trusts Jesus. When Jesus said, come to me, he would stand up out of the boat and start walking. But the day he denied Jesus, the men who met him, they have a different revelation about Peter. But heaven didn't change his view about Peter. That's why when Jesus raised back again to the dead, he said, go and say to my disciple and also Peter. That's when heaven didn't reject him because the blood was powerful okay. enough to wash away. And I think this is a season where we need definitely to understand the power of that blood. It doesn't matter what happened. There will be a lot of shaking, but we do really need to understand that power. I don't care if it's a man of God who come to tell you this mistake you have done is so big and God cannot forgive you. It's not true because Jesus himself said, if any man would deny me in front of men, I would deny him in front of my father. But Peter denied him in front of men, but he didn't deny Peter. We can see for Peter, it was a different case because he knew that thing about Peter was also an attack of the enemy. It was something beyond. That's why he said the devil was looking for, but I pray for you. Yeah. I'm praying also that in, in this season, we need to have fathers who have eyes to understand yes. some of the skin of the devil That's and to right. intercede for the new generation. That's right. And not just say, because this person has done this thing, is yeah. over. And let us keep believing in the power of the cross, the power of the blood. God loves us. He said, ah, we didn't choose him. He chose us before the foundation of the earth. I was a Muslim. It's not now that Jesus will let me down. That means it's not true. But I believe in him. And I still believe in him. If every man stopped believing, I will still believe. The Bible says, let God be truth and all men be a liar. And they will see and they will know that this is the finger of the Lord. Because the finger of the Lord is capable to take a man that everybody has rejected and lift him up again because there is a power in the blood there is a power in the cross that's the only thing i wanted to share and to say mm -hmm. really thank you for this message it's really amazing and powerful thank you mm -hmm. so much awesome that's beautiful yeah 100 percent. thank 100%. you thank you so many how about brad did you just come on just to show us a puppy or you have a comment <laughs> pastor almost dr brad <laughs> You can never find a day that I don't have something to say. You know, wake me up. Well, and it, this is something I had in, in my message. Well, I didn't have it in my message this weekend until I got to church Sunday morning and had a little time with the Lord. And he's like, you know, there's so many people that claim my name and they ask for me to share my heart with them. And when I share my heart with them, they're like, oh, 
yeah, we're so sorry. That hurts. Yeah, we understand that hurts us. And he, he told me, he's like, I don't need someone to feel sorry for the way I feel. I need you to understand these things hurt me. And I put you here to do something about them. Mm. I'm calling my church to action. Mm. There are those that can sit and pray. There are those that will encourage those that will lift others up. But there are also those that have to walk out, hit the streets, be frontline, and know that you've already given your life up. The life you live now, you live through Christ. If you die, you die. Yeah. I know it's harsh, but yeah, it's true. my life's not mine. I've given it to him. So if I'm called to walk into something dangerous because it hurts his heart, then that's fine. Hey, if I go home early, I'm going home. Sharon will be mad at me, but that's okay. But uh, <laughs> it's, but, it's, good. Yeah, it's, it's like the human trafficking thing has always just, just really been forefront for us. And I, I was reading over some statistics the other day of missing children and, and the whole mess of where evidence is that they're going. Oh. And it's just that people aren't doing anything. They're turning their back. And saying, oh, that's so bad because they're afraid of what happens. Mm. And fear will keep us away from the heart of God. Yeah, it's good. And Self preservation. Yes. My life's not mine. It was surrendered. Like you said, if you want to get to the heart of God, you've got to surrender. Yeah. It, um, I, I, I'm glad you said that, Brad, because I, I this wasn't something that I'd planned to share. My son-in-law, who is a pre-Christian, I love him, love him. Um, he, he comes, his dad's a pastor, and he's just kind of held out. He's really, he's a lot closer to making a decision for the Lord than he ever has been, and he's a, he's really been a wonderful. I could just tell you, he's a wonderful guy in a lot of ways, and bold. Today, they live in Charleston. <clears throat> My, my, it's long story. My daughter and the kids are here, but he's getting a house ready for them in Charleston and they live in Charleston. There was a, um, a protest today for the Palestinians against Israel in Charleston. Wow. And, and my son-in-law, God bless him. He, I, I'm telling you when the man fully commits to the Lord, he is all in he, <laughs> by himself on the street, starts yelling, and he, he tapes it on his phone. You can't see him, but you can hear him. He's saying, these are God's chosen people. These are God's chosen people at the top of his voice. He's alone by himself, yelling at the protesters. You've got it wrong. Israel is God's chosen people. And I'm telling you, the man has got more boldness than I. I you could put 100 Christians together, and I just, Still think he might have them beat. I, I was like, but my daughter came and showed me the, you know, the little video, and he was taping the, the um, protest while he's hollering, "These are God's chosen people. Leave them alone. These are God's chosen people." So I, I which puts me to shame, because I'm like, well, let's be politically correct here. Let's understand we got to love the, which we do have to love the Palestinians. I'm all for that. I love the Palestinians. I love Israel. I, I want I want them all to turn to God. And um, I'm listening to some powerful Palestinians online who've come to Jesus and they are powerful. They're just like my son-in-law. So if, if I said brother-in-law, I didn't mean brother-in-law, son-in-law, son-in-law. Um, anyway, um, but I just wanted to amen what you said, Brad, and that story that he did today came to mind, which just the boldness there is, I think, amazing. And that's the boldness that we need in Christ through the Holy Spirit. So amen. And Jolie, I'm glad you said, I'm glad you said uh, brother-in-law. If you, I, I don't remember you saying that, but if you did, I get yeah. the older our kids get, the actually the younger we get. And yeah, so right. they're, like, they're like brothers and sisters. <laughs> right. That's right. Anyway. Oh, so good. All right. Um, let me ask anybody else, Sharon and Nancy, when, Dr. Wendy, anything, you guys, Sarah, uh, Van, Clarine, look at Clarine. She's ready to say something. I know she is. And so is Dr. Wendy. No? Okay. Dr. Wendy, you got something. Yeah. 
Hi, Anita. So good to see you again. It's been a couple of years. Um, so I loved everything you said, and I have tons and tons of notes. And um, God was God's been giving me this revelation on Genesis two, having to do with the garden and in the river, and how God put you know Adam or man in, um, and how out of spending that time in the present. Ooh, let me just go back. You're talking about fire the whole time, and God's been speaking to me about water and the river. So I'm like, Lord, how's this going to work? Because I've been just soaking in the river with him. And so I don't know where he's going to go with that. But I want, one, of, one of the things I wanted to tell you was um, when he's pointing out, he was showing, you know, like, so we're in the garden um, as Christians, you know, now. Um, and so, like, say we had the tree of knowledge and the tree of life in there. And then he says that the river flows, you know, into the garden and out of the garden, four rivers come. And, if, and I'm sure a lot of you already researched this, but the each one of the rivers, if you look them up in the Hebrew, what they mean. And so the Lord has shown me as you spend that time um, in the garden with the Lord. And, you know, Eden means delight and his pleasure. So you're spending that time with him. The river's flowing into you, right? So you're getting that presence. And then out of that time with him, four rivers are coming out of you. Wow. And if you look up each one, they talk about abundance. One is getting the land. Like the if you look up the Euphrates, Euphrates River, um, I did all this stuff. I was telling my friends about this. It's just fascinating. So out of that time. But then, the, but what you said, which clicked, the Lord said, realize that, yes, you have the tree of life in there. So you're feeding on me and all that. But you also have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So during that time when you're in my presence, you're still going to be getting those little, like little flies, you know what I mean? That there's, they're still there. And so when you're talking about James, just going through that, I was like, oh my goodness, I just need to go. That's kind of like that tree of knowledge of good and evil, what you're saying there. And so I didn't get that. So I'm waiting now for the Lord, give me more revelation on that. So I appreciate everything you said. And, um, you know, I love studying again, the Hebrew. And so, you know, the, the 84, you know, eight is the gate and then four is the door in Hebrew. And I just love that when you're showing that the King of glory, co you know, comes through the gate and um, I'm like, Oh my goodness. So Nancy knows I go home and I'm like, after this, I'll be sitting there and I'm going to be eating, just eating the word. Going, okay, Lord, just explain this. And uh, so I just want to thank you for all that. I have so much of your notes and I'm just going to really I'm going to get full because I too am fasting right now. So I'm going to go get full in the word. <laughs> awesome. Wendy, you're going to have to come back and share what you, what you got. That was awesome. That's awesome. Um, when you brought up the, I have to, uh, I'm going to have to say it when, when you brought up the garden, um, you know, I've been kind of meditating on this whole new creation mandate. And I think um, Sharon knows that about regeneration and all that type of stuff. So, um, so one of the things the Lord was showing me was the garden. And he said, um, he said, you know, he said, uh, eternity flows through, through you. Actually it's in your heart, which is your inner man heart, but he said also in your cardia, but he said, it's like the garden. Your, your heart is like the, the soil, the garden. He said, um, he was showing me, it's like Adam and Eve. He said, Nancy, you know, you got to keep your heart clean. You know, got, you got to clean out the heart, the cardia too. You got to clean out the cardia uh, your your heart heart and and that is um the emotions of all the stuff and your inner man heart because as you do then the things can flow out of it and that you can remain in that place but he he was talking about that for for eternity because many people are pressing into that reality so um i just thought that was interesting it all comes into purity and uh cleansing your inner man but also your cardia because it's all related like right your body takes in all that stuff and you can your organs take in all that stuff and sharon is a um is a victory statement of what that means she's had victory in that too so but this is awesome okay I, i'm gonna stop there so we could go on other other comments <laughs> jump in but, but, uh, this has been so great no nobody else okay uh, Wendy. Uh, Nancy, as you were sharing about, you know, the heart and the cardia, you know, the heart is a muscle, right? Mm -hmm. And it's so important. It also represents love. And then Anita was talking from the book of James 4, and that's so powerful. I just see that working together about faith without works is dead. And it's like the eternity flows through our our heart and our veins, but also it's it's faith that puts it into action. So it's like 
we need to strengthen our heart muscles to purify, to, to take care, and then to allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse us, bring anything to the surface that we need to repent of so that we really do have um, pure heart and clean hands, that it's not just a cliche. I feel the Lord wants us to meditate on that in a new way this year so that we can go deeper and higher in uh, surrender and a laid down life for the Lord. Good points, good points. Emily had a question, and I think, Sarah, you had a comment. Um, yes, I was wondering, is the, do you see a big difference between the church and Australia compared to the church in America as far as walking and dedication and, and being committed to the Lord? Or do you just see that we're kind of, since we kind of follow each other a lot, kind of at the same place of, of unfortunately compromise? And um, yeah. just what do you see? around um, I, th I i as to both western nations um there's a lot of similar issues let's say that because there's just western issues <laughs> but culturally there are hindrances on both sides that are different here and that's why there's need a need for cross-pollination because there's blind spots we both have. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you guys have something that we need that we lack. And I feel like whether America feels like it or not, I feel like we have stuff that you guys need. And I feel the biggest problem here is the fact you don't think you need anything. Like that's what I come up against. And it's hard to tell. Yeah, it's, 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 it's challenging here. Um, but it's, there's hardness of heart here and there's hardness of art in Australia, but differently, if that makes sense. So you're dealing with different, different things like, um, so that's why there's such a beautiful balance. I see the two nations have, um, in, I believe if, if, and I see it working, I see God really making the two nations working together, um, even though we're, a, I mean, we're a tiny nation when it comes to population compared to America. Um, but yet I still feel like Australia has a voice to the nations in the sense of it has a significant role within this, um, this what we plan that's, you know, outplaying in, in this space. But I feel like both nations at the moment are in alignment seasons and God is definitely aligning um, the two nations in, but differently. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question without going into yes. really deep detail, that's, but that's yeah. great. That's great. And what you're giving is the solution to both, to all the problems, you know, so, and, and thank you. I didn't have a suggest to say yeah. thank you, but thank you so much for what you shared. Yes. Yeah, bless you. Last comment, Sarah, jump in there. If anybody else has anything, type it in the chat because we are going to have to let everybody go here. But go ahead, Sarah. Hi, thank you for everything you shared. Um, I have a question of what you think the church will look like when it goes through that purification process and comes out of the old into the new. Do you have any thoughts on that, what the church would, would look like in that new stage? Um, well, without sounding really generic, which it's going to sound generic, sorry, it's going to sound really generic and almost pitiful, but I really see um, a people that love God more than they love themselves and a people that because they love God more than they love themselves, um, the nations of the earth will be turned upside down. Love, Loving God, like I feel like God is returning his church to love him, to love him first. And he said to me the other day, though, those that love me first will win the war. That's what I heard him say. And um, and I and I just feel like, you know, we've tried to love each other without loving God first and, and getting mm. our head around what that looks like. Um, mm. And so the purification process is all about loving him first. 
um, bringing, bringing us back to loving him first, the first commandment. And then out of that space, we're going to love each other. And when we love each other, the world is going to see then that we're the disciples of Christ. So that's the process I'm seeing. You know, as I said, we see in part, and Nancy was sharing things that, you know, the body are pushing into, and there's all different parts that are God's dropping down for different ones to push into the reality of, of the fullness of God, really. Um, but I just see love as the center of it all because I feel that um, unless there's love, it's all futile. So I believe that's the heart of God behind all of everything that he's doing um, is just is just revealing how much he loves us first. Obviously, we love him because he loves us first. But if we don't have the junk out of our heart, we can't even receive the love from him. Mm. So it's we got to be able to receive the love from him and understand because it's all blindness. Otherwise it's all distorted perceptions of him. So I see a people that come out the other end or a people that know they're loved and they fully love. And, and with that, it's going to change the world. That's, and I mean, I know it sounds really cliche and idealistic. <laughs> when I used to write history papers at school, my, my, my professor used to say, oh my gosh, you're the most idealistic student there is, but it's just, it's just how I am. It's just how I see things. I just see things very, I just think, I think God is got like that. It's, he's good. He's always got good news. And I, and I just really feel like he has given us the earth. And so, so let's just love him and that, I, I don't know. Did that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's coming. Everything flows out of the love for God, even the love for people. We can't love people first until we love God and we can fake yeah. it. Or people fake it. Yeah. But, so there's, I just feel like the hypocrisy is going to be gone. And in that mm -hmm. is going to be just this power that, yeah, everyone's wanting the power and they're seeing they're after revival, revival. And they say power, power. But they're not understanding that that might of God is is yeah it's it's not going to fall on crooked places and and impure, impure spirits of perversion and all this wayward because perversion actually means the waywardness of the heart so where we backslide or we 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 we're wayward so God has to come and do that so that that what we're after to see the impossible possible and see kingdom come. It all is going to come from that. So, yeah, that's how I see it. Oh. Thank you. And I, I think, um, Sarah, you, lo you, you lost or you got offline, but you can come back on and re listen to the reruns because I'll go ahead and post that. And I'm, we, we do have to go at six. We want to honor uh, Dr. Anita with her family. And then we have her coming back on Wednesday in, in Charlotte and in Fort Mill, actually, at the Missions House. You're welcome to come. We will run that online as well. And um, I would love for Dr. George to close us out in prayer. Thank you, Dr. Anita. Thank you, everyone, for being here and for all your questions and comments. Thank Thanks. you, Nancy. Thank you, Dr. Anita. Lord, we just thank you for this refreshing washing in the Word and the Spirit, that we would walk in the Spirit continually, moment by moment, seeking you, hungering for you, fasting and praying for your presence, the beauty of your holiness. And we just love that what Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Lord, we do love you and our heart overflows with the joy that you give us to not walk in the ways of the world, to not be deceived by the ways of the world, to know that we just want to please you, God, by faith. We want to see you smile. We want to bring joy to your heart every day, Lord, as we expand the kingdom and destroy the works of the enemy, walking in the humble authority that we have through Christ alone. And thank you, Lord, that by the blood of Jesus, we have access to the throne of grace, that we can come in confidently with boldness, and courage to receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. Thank you so much, everyone. Happy New Year and yeah. be excited and expecting. And thank you so much, Anita. Bless you. you all. Thank you so See much. You